This episode is brought to you by DirecTV Stream. DirecTV Stream is your home for football this season because it's the best way to catch the games you won't want to miss. And with the DirecTV Stream Sports Hub, you can follow your favorite teams and track scores all in one place. That means more ways to follow the biggest hits, drives, and wins this season. So many you may need your own touchdown dance. So get your sports together and get your TV together at directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Four is Not on the Schedule. I'm your host, Eric, alongside with expert analyst Rod. Thanks for joining us on the best MSU basketball podcast featuring an in-depth recruiting, game matchup, and post-game analysis. We dive deep to give you the best tools to enjoy the Spartans and impress your friends and family. Hey everybody, it's Eric here alongside Rod, and it's time to begin our Big Ten preseason show where we talk about all the different teams in the Big Ten and then obviously finish with the best team, Michigan State. And we're going to do a couple of these every week and get you all geared up for the season as football starts rolling along. By the time we hit the end, it'll be time for a tip. I'd like to also remind those of you who are on the email list where you can go to the website at tffinots.com or you can go to the final four, it's not the schedule.com. And there you can sign up to for the email list where we send occasional things. And as people who have already signed up, they are aware now we are having a contest this year. It's going to actually span the entire season (laughs) so it's really aligned with what we're doing today so the contest is for you you email us you give us your prediction for one through 14 of the big 10 teams finals in the standings as we know uh, if you've listened to the show for a while rod does his predictions every year last year he had 43 points and so the way we're going to do the scoring is just like we did for the show there's no good way since it's an unbalanced schedule and this is going to be the cop out that uh, Rod will have this season. And outside of the fact that I think the Big Ten is going to be more wide open than probably ever before. Uh, so for every standing your way from the the team, you get a point. So if someone you predict fourteen, they finish thirteen, you get one point. And then whoever's the least amount of points, just like golf, would win our competition. The winner is going to get a uh, free T-shirt and an opportunity to be on the show if they want. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, so you have to have your entries in before the first Big Ten game. So we're recording this first episode before the season schedules out for the Big Ten. So I'm not sure exactly when that'll be, but I imagine it'll be probably sometime in mid-December, the first two uh, Big Ten games they have in play. So make sure you either sign up at the uh, at our website at uh, tffinots.com, or you certainly can just email us at tffinots at gmail.com, and there you can send your name email address, obviously, and then your prediction for 1 through 14. You can wait until you hear all these shows to get a better idea for what you're going to predict. And so, with that being said, we're going to launch right into it. So, Rod, you ready to have a perfect prediction seat this season? Let's do it. <laughs> I I think if there's any year where you have no chance of getting all 14 right, this would be the year. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. It's I've said this before, but the the problem with trying to um, sort out what what the where the league is likely to finish is that everybody's flawed. There's and obviously every team has flaws always. Even a you know Indiana's 1976 unbeaten team had flaws. But what I mean by that is. Every team in the league has, you can look at it and say, well, there's there's a serious issue here that is going to need to come up the right way for this team to reach its potential. And we don't normally have that. We've normally got, like, heading into last season, you know, I was, <laughs> it ended up being wrong, but <laughs> I was convinced that Purdue was a team without any obvious weakness and offensively, that was certainly the case. They were great. I did not anticipate that they would regress so dramatically defensively. And that ended up being the reason why they didn't win the big 10 reason why they didn't have a final four type run in the tournament, despite the fact that it was, I think in terms of pure quote unquote talent, the best team Matt painters ever had. Um, So even in that case, that team ended up with flaws. But usually in the preseason, we've got a team or sometimes two or three 
that we would we would be able to say that about them. Oh, they look, you know, we know something will go wrong, but on paper they look pretty solid. We don't have that this year, and so it's very difficult. Not so difficult identifying the first few teams we're going to talk about since we move from the bottom up. There are there are clearly some teams that are in worse shape than others, but picking a winner in this conference or even who's going to be your top three, let's say, very, very challenging, yeah. in my opinion. And I think so. And I think on top of that, we do have the unbalanced schedule. We don't see those schedules. And so the predictions right. are going to be a little bit trickier. And for the for the actual finals, we're going to say whatever the seating is and ends up for the Big Ten tournament. So that'll be all the tiebreakers and stuff. I'll say this: we do we do know we do know single who the single plays are and who the double True. plays are for everybody. We know that we just don't know the exact um, the exact order in which they fall, um, which can matter, of course. Uh, you know, when it's, it's always, uh, not only the case of who you play, but when you play them, that was a Jim Leland line from baseball definitely applies to big Ten basketball. Um, but I will say this, I am making these picks. My philosophy on this is if you start trying to overcompensate, trying to figure out, well, what's the impact of the schedule going to be, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think you can get too clever by half pretty easily <laughs> so my philosophy on this is i'm making these picks based based on how in a in a as objective of vacuum as you could find how good these teams are relative to each other that's my guiding philosophy i'm i'm just not factoring in scheduling advantages or disadvantages in part, again, because I go back to what we just talked about, in a league that is so difficult to sort out, I, I don't buy that somebody can tell me right now that a road game in February at Rutgers is easier than a road game in February in Bloomington, Indiana. I, I know people's minds go to historically what that means, but I don't know what it's going to mean this year. You know, yeah. we have to, I'm just using that as an example. I'm not wed to that particular uh, dichotomy between those two programs, but you get my point. Um, so uh, scheduling is playing zero role in the order that I'm putting these teams in They're They're in the order of what I, from bottom to top of what I think they will be relative to each other in terms of quote unquote strength or quality, however you want to, whatever term you want to use. Right. And of course the other complicating factor, aside from the fact that injuries can occur and you know, that can totally change the makeup of a team and you know, where you, your flaws may become huge well, yeah. flaws, right? I mean, that's obviously always the case, but of course, well, that's the, always, yeah. yeah, but of course, even, even evaluating team from one year to the next, you at least had some sort of guideline or some sort of idea for what they were the year before. You know who they're bringing back and you know who their additions. Right. Now, the amount of additions, and you can have teams that are radically different from year to year. And let's begin with today, right? <laughs> the first couple that we're going to do fall into that category completely and up and down the league. And by the way, spoiler alert for Michigan State fans, Michigan State's relative continuity is a reason why I think they're going to actually finish quite nicely in this league because continuity is just not a given anymore. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So let's begin with everybody's favorite darling team that just never can quite get it together, and that's Nebraska. Nebraska has been the the, the whipping boy for the Big Ten ever since they joined, really. I mean, they've occasionally been sort of okay, but I don't think they've made the tournament since they've been part of the Big Ten. I don't think they've even had a winning record. They have. They have. Uh, Tim Miles. Did Miles take to the tournament once? The tournament. I guess I yep. remember that. Uh, so last season, so Fred Hoiberg came in, much ballyhooed. He was very successful at Iowa State. He then had a stint in the NBA. He returned to the coaching ranks in the college, and he's someone who was very good with transfer uh, transfer players yep. at, at Iowa State. I think he got Corey Lucius. I think Corey Lucius went over to Iowa State back when he was coach. Chris Allen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's now entering his um, his fourth season. And last year they were ten and twenty two overall, only four Big Ten wins out of twenty tries. It's his third season, and you know, la or last year was his third season, and it looked like he had he was set up to do really well, uh, to actually probably you know be successful. And it just did not work out, aside from a very brief, very brief stretch at the very end of the season where they looked 
unbeatable for <laughs> for like two or three games. They were incredible. They were really pretty uh, abysmal. Uh, so they they had the biggest recruit in uh, their history with Bryce McGowan's, the younger brother Trey McGowan's. He was a McDonald's All American. They were, but they ended up being 140th in Ken Palm overall with a 117 offense and a number 178 defense. And there wasn't anything about them. It was they did very well. They didn't rebound well. They were terrible <laughs> in the plus 300 both rebounding areas. Uh, and then they lost a lot of players. And so I, I guess you know we'll just begin by just saying it was a super disappointing season for them when we thought they're going to make some moves. And you've got to imagine at this point that Fred Hoiberg. If, if there is a hot seat that exists, I imagine it, he's got to be close. To, it's maybe warming up at this point, don't you think? You know, here here's the thing. If you look at it, the whole idea behind them firing Tim Miles was, okay, we're we're serious about trying to make Nebraska basketball a, at least competitive, if not a threat, right? But Fred Hoiberg's had three years. He has yet to match the worst season (laughs) that Tim miles had Tim miles went to the NCAA tournament. It's not a big deal in East Lansing, but it's a big deal in Lincoln, Nebraska, because they've only done it seven times in their history, their history folks. Let that sink in. (laughs) Um, the next time you want to start poor mean about the last two seasons of Michigan state basketball, it can be worse. Um, So, yeah, you measure that and you say, well, wait a minute. This guy hasn't, he's had three tries. He hasn't even matched the worst year that his predecessor had. What are we doing? And if if we don't see improvement soon, shouldn't he be gone? And in a normal circumstance, I would say yes. But I think there's a, I think there's a couple of factors in, in play here. One is that at Nebraska, you get a longer leash. There's, there's just no doubt about that because they've, ex- what I just alluded to, they've experienced so little success that, um, and, and despite the fact that their attendance numbers are good, you know, they seem to have the things around the program that would allow for it to be successful. The fact of the matter is basketball has never been a big deal at Nebraska. And so the pressure that's associated with that job is not on par with most of the rest of the big 10. If you had three seasons, the likes of which Fred Hoiberg has posted pretty much anywhere else in the big 10, except maybe happy Valley, you'd be out on your ass no matter who you are. I mean, the guy, the guy was 10 and 22, four and 16. That's his best season so far, (laughs) right? It's the first time he's reached double digits in wins overall, not in the league overall. The other thing is that, and I, I, I would have to go back and refresh my memory as to his, his contract particulars, but I believe he is very well compensated. And I don't know that Nebraska is in a, in a spot where they're just, you know, going to eat that. I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head, how long his, his contract is for. Um, but it's, it, I'll freely admit I am shocked by what's happened. Absolutely shocked because I thought when they got him, it was a coup. I mean, I, I was so impressed with the job Fred Hoiberg did at Iowa state. And then, you know, you mentioned it, not just the two guys from MSU transferred in there, Fred Hoiberg's whole thing during his tenure at Iowa state was built on transfers and he was doing it in an era where usually, you know, you could get grad transfers eligible immediately, but Anybody other than that was still sitting out a year in most circumstances, unless they get a hardship waiver, which was not a given in that period. He, he just seemed to have a knack for acclimating guys into his thing very quickly. And he did it. He did it over and over and over again. And so I thought, boy, he's coming to Nebraska a school with frankly, better resources, not better tradition, but better resources than Iowa state has. Um, now he's in an era where the transfer opportunities are even greater. It's much more wide open, immediate eligibility, blah, you know, blah, blah, blah. Of course he's built for this. I thought, I thought by year two, they'd be irritating. And by now I figured they would be a pain in the ass for everybody. Kind of like what Rutgers has emerged into where 
you can't take them lightly in any game. You know, that program's gotten to the point that you know you're in for a tough day at the office, even if you're better than they are. I thought that's what would happen at Nebraska by now, and they're not even close. And I think I think the main reason um, is you look at, I, I mentioned it a few moments ago, continuity. You look at the continuity from year to year for Fred Hoiberg, and it's just non-existent. Every season, he seems to be largely starting over. And that is a very, very difficult way to succeed in a conference like the Big Ten. Unless, you know, obviously if you're Coach K, you're John Calipari, and the guys you're bringing in are high, high, high level guys year after year after year, okay. Lack of continuity may be, it'll still be an issue for you, but you may be able to just overwhelm it with sheer talent. Nebraska obviously is not bringing in guys like that. And then even when they do, you know, we'll talk about it in a second, but Bryce McGowan, you mentioned the biggest recruit in Nebraska basketball history, I, I would think, certainly in my lifetime, he is because he was a McDonald's All American. They just, they, they don't even sniff those guys historically. And what did he do with them? Not much, yeah, right. you know, and, and so that's even when he had that kind of talent on board, it just didn't work. Um, you know, I, I go back to Tim miles for a second before we delve into who they lost and who they got coming back and who they added and all that. Um, my, my knock on Tim miles toward the end of his tenure. And I do believe it had a lot to do with why he ended up getting fired is he too had a real problem with roster continuity, he was the last like three or four years he was there. He just couldn't keep guys in Lincoln. He kept losing them either in one instance. I remember he had a big kid uh, who's actually from Michigan named Walter Pritchard, who just decided to retire from the sport <laughs> rather than return to Nebraska. He had guys turn pro who had no chance to be NBA players he had guys transfer elsewhere. He lost, um, he lost a kid to Kansas one year, um, who was a big time scorer for him at Nebraska. Uh, this kept happening over and over and over. And that's why I felt in the end, Tim miles got fired because he just couldn't keep his teams together enough to be able to get back over the hump. He had the one tournament season, but was unable to repeat it. But my God, his teams look like Tom Izzo, Michigan state by comparison <laughs> to what's going on with Fred Hoiberg. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, he's starting over again. I'm sure they feel like, you know, this is, and I look, I like Fred Hoiberg. I've got no ax to grind. His son played at MSU. Of course. Um, I think he's a guy that is a, to have a really good relationship with. He was a great pro unbelievable college player at Iowa state. Great pro career. Uh, as we said, had that success at Iowa State as a coach, but this is a disaster. Yeah, and I mean, there's just no other way to put it. Yeah, I think so, and I think you know, you could probably say, well, part of that is COVID. It it happened right, you know, as you're trying to build a program, and then COVID hits, and it makes things weird. You know, th that may give him a little bit of grace, an extra year or so. That that yeah, he, right, possibly, yeah. Because uh, I think we all agree that COVID affected Michigan State significantly more, some players more than others, and just the continuity of of things. And and to your continuity point, I think it's important to point out, even at K Kentucky, they have plenty of players who stick around the four years who are play significant roles, even though they may not be the you know the amazing five star recruits, and so they can still maintain that culture and that. Um, that continuity that you might need for the new guys coming in and you know, at least how you play defense and stuff. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, even, even without bodies, the, the program has it, the program understand, right. you know, you're walking in as a new player to a situation where it's all about winning. And so the expectations are clear when you're recruited, the expectations are clear when you get there, the structure is in place. I mean, right now, and, I, and by the way, he said Hoiberg's had constant reshuffling in his staff, too. He hasn't been able to keep his, his coaching staff together. It's just there's no continuity anywhere in this program, and that is built on top of a lack 
of basketball tradition, you know? Sure. So you've, you've really got a, a, a sand castle built upon a sand castle, <laughs> you know? Yeah. In the earthquake zone. All right. So let's talk, right. let's talk about right. the, on the sand on the San Andreas fault. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about, uh, the players that have departed the team. And, you know, we just talked about continuity, the, the McGowan brothers, uh, Bryce McGowan's was the one we were talking about the, he averaged seven, almost 17 points a game, but he shot a lot. He, um, would average a lot of fouls. He got, he'd average six free throws a game. Um, and he was the second leader rebound at five rebounds a game. And so it seems like he's probably the biggest loss. I mean, obviously is there, you know, as you said, their greatest recruit they've had in recent history. So he departs as well as his brother, Trey, uh, who just really struggled last year. He was hurt and only averaged about seven points a game on 41, 37, and 62 shooting. But didn't really seem like the same player he'd been before, where he looked like he was a lot, a lot more comfortable with the ball. Well, if you remember Trey McGowan's the year prior when he was healthy, um, I remember a game against Michigan State. I think it was... I think it was the first half because if I remember it was, he carried them in the first half and then Teddy Allen got hot and carried them in the second and really pushed MSU the COVID year. But um, Trey McGowan's at his best was kind of a downhill player. And I don't mean he was one of these fullback dive guys that that's all he does. Obviously you could see he could shoot the jumper, but when he got rolling, he was really the epitome of a downhill player, just kind of attacking and and pushing the ball at you and i didn't see very much of that from him last year uh so that, but again he was hurt missed a lot of time he only played in about half their games so you know you give him a mulligan i guess for that his younger brother bryce i th there were a lot of parallels in some ways to max christie like max christie mcdonald's all-american like max christie you know purportedly a very skilled wing and Yet, I, I think the shot selection was even worse than Max's. I, some games I saw the shots he was taking <laughs> yeah. were just incredible to me. Now, Fred Hoiberg has always been a guy whose offense has kind of thrived on being fast and loose. So I don't know that the way Bryce was playing was actually pissing his coach off or not. I don't know. Um, but it was striking to me. And I think that, that shot selection was reflected in his numbers, you know, 40, 27, that's not great. And if you watched him play, you could understand how he got there. So I think when you, when you try to measure what kind of loss this is, you know, the counting numbers, it looks huge. Hey, you had a guy who scored 17 a night as a freshman. Yeah, of course you're going to, you're going to take a hit when he goes. But I think much like with Max Christie at Michigan state, I think, you have to be careful about what you're extrapolating going forward into the unknown. If you're assuming that, okay, Bryce McGowan's is going to display better shot selection. He's going to be a more efficient version of what he was as a freshman. Okay. Then I get it. That's a law. That's a significant loss because a guy with his talent level playing with better judgment, that's a big deal. That's hard. It's a hard player to handle. And maybe in fact, that's what we would have seen, but I, I think that's a hell of an assumption numerically. And, and just in terms of the minutes, these two guys going, it, it leaves a big hole. You've got to, somebody's going to have to step up and replace those minutes, take those shots, et cetera. Yeah. You just, if you're Fred Hoiberg, you have to hope that the somebody or some buddies who are doing it are able to do it more efficiently. Absolutely. Yeah. When you look at uh, another departure is Alonzo Verge. He was a six, four guard. He averaged uh, 14 and a half points a game uh, on 46, 32, 77 shooting, led the team in assists at better than five a game, but he also turned over the ball a lot. He turned it over three times a game. And so again, efficiency is a problem. And I mean, this is sort of, you know, just, this is kind of the story in, out of, out of Nebraska that they're kind of a little bit out of control and a little loose of the ball and, you know, having trouble, having trouble holding on to possessions and getting, you know, either getting them with rebounding or then uh, with turning the ball over. Every single year, Hoiberg's been at Nebraska. Um, he's had a similar type of point guard. So if you, if you go back to his first year, he had, um, he had Cameron Mack. You remember him? Yep who is just kind of wild. I mean, athletically impressive, 
but just a wild out of control player who could put up counting numbers, but was really inefficient. And the next year, I mean, it depends on who you call the point guard on that team. Uh, Teddy Allen certainly had the ball in his hands a lot. Teddy Allen was, you know, a guy who, when he got going was almost impossible to stop offensively, but again, judgment, not his strong suit. And then with last year's team, Alonzo verge, again, you look at some of those numbers that he put up and it's, you know, 14 and a half points a game. Hey, that's not better, better than five assists per game. Yeah. But he had, that's his usage rate was off the charts. He, he had the ball in his hands all the time. And so when that's the case, yeah, you probably are going to put up some counting numbers, (laughs) but are you good? I don't know. Three turn better than three turnovers a game probably isn't good by anybody's standards. 32% shooting the three. Eh, you know, not an outright disaster, but not great. Um, so he, he left with eligibility remaining and went undrafted, which has happened to this program in the last, since they've joined the big 10 more times than I can count, uh, somebody who could have returned doesn't. And it's not like they even went to a better situation. They just went to oblivion, but, um, it's another guy that's got to be replaced. He played a lot of minutes and was in a big role. Well, then we'll look at Lat Mayan. He's a 6'9", stretch four. He averaged almost six points a game and a little under four rebounds a game. Shot 39, 30, and 74. Uh, he was worse last year, than at least number-wise, than he was previous year. And he just decided to leave uh, and not take his COVID year. That's unfortunate because they probably could have used him. But uh, his play really declined. Two years ago, his first year in Nebraska, he was actually a better player. He was just all, all his numbers declined last season versus his first year. So, you know, even if he had come back, what he would have been, I, I'm not sure. Right. And that's a lot of, you know, that's obviously with anyone, just like you're saying with Max Christie, you can envision him coming back and being a lot better, but he could have been the same player. And then you'd be really frustrated, even more frustrated. Than or before. worse. Or worse. Yeah. yeah right. Or worse. Um, yeah. So next is Kobe Webster. 6'1 shooting guard. He averaged 6.2 points a game, 38, 36, and 67 shooting, which was pretty good. But, you know, he was, uh, he'd hit double digit threes a couple times, but then would also not score on occasions as well. Yeah. Three times he was in double digits, three times he went scoreless. So that's kind of the Kobe Webster experience at Nebraska. It was feast or famine. He was definitely a guy who was capable of getting hot. And, and he seemed to me, and I'm not, I mean, obviously I saw Nebraska a fair amount. I wasn't locked into them the way a Nebraska fan would be, but from the outside, he definitely seemed to me to be a guy who was more a streaky shooter than a good one. You know, it, you could get a game where he might bust four threes on you. And then the next time out, he goes zero for five. Sure. Um, that seemed, it, that seemed to me to be the kind of player he was. The other problem, Kobe Webster is when you're six one, but you're really not any kind of point guard, that's kind of a limitation. Uh, it only really works if you're playing alongside a bigger point guard, which not every team has. Cause if you're not, then you may have some defensive issues and Nebraska certainly had those not a bad player. I mean, they'll, they'll miss him in the sense that he was a veteran who, they knew was at least capable on any given night of heating up and giving them some punch off the bench, but not a guy who would seem to be irreplaceable either. Next, we go on to Eduardo Andre, a 6'11", 5 man who averaged 3.1 points a game, 3.2 rebounds a game, uh, and just a little over 11 minutes a game. Nothing really spectacular, but I obviously a team that's depleted. Some of you probably want to bring around for the next year, and maybe he develops into a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, they his his departure may have been uh, hastened in part by a guy or two that Nebraska added um, in in recruiting. He may have felt like maybe his path to an increased role wasn't as obvious. But I have to say, to me, he was actually somebody who, especially when Big Ten play hit, started to show some real potential. And those numbers are not bad on a per minute basis, you know. If, if he was given, you know, say 25 minutes a night, you're talking about, you know, a guy like seven and six, yeah, that kind of thing. That's, that would be okay. Production for a freshman big, you know? Um, and this program for the entirety of the time they've been in the big 10, 
has had a perpetual issue in the post. Like they may solve it like last year and this year, Derek Walker, who we'll talk about, has actually given them a reasonably good option. But by and large, Nebraska has been caught woefully short, no pun intended, (laughs) at the five. So when you have a guy who's young and shows some potential, hey, this guy might be something as an upperclassman and you lose him to Fresno State, that that's not great. But be that as it may, he's gone. Welcome to Nebraska. All right. So finally, Keon Edwards, he was a 6'9 swing man, played about 19 games last season, but then has since transferred to Milwaukee. Yeah, he just didn't. Uh, you know, he was a guy who started his career out at DePaul, and I don't think he actually played there, uh, but he was at DePaul for a year. Then he transferred to Nebraska. They thought they had a diamond in the rough, a, a guy who could be a, a skilled four-man type. Uh, but he didn't really break through. I mean, he played 19 games, but the minutes were sparing, and his opting to leave is not a shocker either because he seemed – I think he, if I remember correctly, he also had a bit of a traveling man history in high school. So you're seeing that now with the ease with which guys can just bounce around. There's certain players that it just becomes very obvious they're – there are three or four different schools before they even hit college. And if that's the track record, the odds that they're going to be in one place for long at the next level would not seem to be great to me. And that sort of was Keon Edwards story. We've all worked with people like this. Hubs. <laughs> so we look at return, go to returning players. The aforementioned Derek Walker, he's a six, nine, 240 pound senior. He was one of the better players from last year, averaging nine and a half points a game on 68% from the floor and 73% of the line. Led the team in rebounding at six a game and averaged about a block a contest. So he's a guy who's someone they can count on at least a little bit of that continuity that they need to try, hopefully build around for the season. Yeah, and, and very rarely in the decade or so that Nebraska has been in the Big Ten have they had a guy at the five spot that you could just pencil in before the season and say, all right, we know what we're going to get here and it's going to be solid production. They've got that with Derek Walker. He really, he was a, a guy, just to refresh people's memory, he transferred in there from Tennessee rotation, a full rotation guy, kind of barely in there. Transfers to Nebraska, and then if I remember correctly, the COVID year, he became eligible like at the semester break. So they didn't even have for the full season. But once they got him, he showed some flashes that first year. And then last season really emerged. I mean, you look at... <laughs> Anytime you've got a guy who shoots 68% from the floor, one thing it tells me at the very least is he knows who he is. <laughs> yes, right. Because you can't shoot 68% from the floor if you're taking shots that are outside of your capability, right? So he's an interior guy. He can dunk. He can use his body to create some space for himself in the post to finish. And he did that effectively at times. He's not ideal for the Big Ten as the only option, let's say, in the sense that, as we've we've talked about many times and will continue to, the Big Ten still has some absolute giants. I mean, we've you've still got Hunter Dickinson, you've still got Zach Eady, so you've still got these guys that are seven foot plus. Um, maybe not as many of them because Kofi's out of the league. But there's still a lot of them, and, and Derek Walker at 6'9 isn't going to be able to handle most of those guys one-on-one very effectively. Um, we're not talking about a Xavier Tillman that can just play beyond his size. That's not Derek Walker. But look, this is Nebraska, so you can't you can't nitpick like that. On balance, Derek Walker is a very productive player for them. He gives them an interior offensive option they haven't, they've rarely had, and he can rebound a little bit, something that as a team they're abysmal at. So um, a very, very valuable guy, no question. Next is C.J. Wilcher. Wilcher is a 6'5 sophomore who transferred from Xavier, played last year and averaged eight, uh, eight points a game on 46, 41, 63 shooting. 65% of his shots came from the three. And he's pretty good. And I think, you know, he'll probably be one of their, one of their again, along with Walker, probably one of those scoring options, maybe their inside-outside sort of combo. Yeah. Yeah, I think he pretty clearly, with the McGowans and Verge having moved on, C.J. Wilcher becomes the guy on the perimeter. And he's, 
you know, at least on the surface, his numbers are something to be encouraged about because this was a guy who was opposed to some of the others I just mentioned actually shot the ball very efficiently. I mean, 41% from three, he absolutely lived up to his advanced billing. He's another guy. He transferred from Xavier. I mentioned this with Ken Edwards. He was at Xavier, but he never played there. So he still got multiple years of eligibility left, but his rep coming out of high school was as a shooter. And he actually shot to that reputation. So now the key, the next step is, all right, you go from being a guy who was a part of things to the guy offensively, can you stay somewhere close to that level of efficiency? That's going to be the question he has to answer. And he, and also as a guy who's probably probably going to be number one on the scouting report exactly. for the opponents, you know, all those things are in play. But um, I think you have to feel pretty good about C.J. Wilcher if you're a Nebraska fan. Good size. It now is a proven shooter. It's not just a rumor. Um, and, uh, and he's got a year of experience under his belt so they'll be looking for him to take a big step up but maintain that level of efficiency as a shooter that he had next is kasai tomananga he's a 6'2 junior he averaged 5.7 points a game on 37 33 84 shooting uh and and i and you mentioned the notes and i agree i remember him shooting a lot <laughs> he would always seem to he always seemed to uh really liked whatever he saw rarely have i ever seen my my all-time standard and i'm going to go back into the annals for this one my all-time standard of a guy who would fit the never met a shot he didn't like definition and just would hoist from anywhere at any time was a guy i used to play at iowa in the 90s named chris kingsbury yes i don't know how many people remember him chris kingsbury who was like a six five wing would pull up from the timeline i mean 35 feet away no big deal that now the game has changed largely due to steph curry that it's not unheard of for guys depending upon the gym you're in um it's not unheard of for guys to shoot from the logo the center court logo you'll still see that depending upon how big the logo is <laughs> right but yes. yeah exactly uh but tomanaga my god it's not even just the distance it's like catch and shoot from 30 feet, <laughs> like just no hesitation, just catch the pass, turn and fire all in one motion. And it's remarkable in a way with that kind of shot selection for him to have shot 33% on threes. It tells me he actually does have shooting ability because that's not a horrible number given maybe some of the worst shot selection I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so Look, there, I don't know how much he continues to play is going to be dependent in part on how much some of the guys they have brought in emerge, but he's going to be in their rotation somewhere. And I think essentially the role is going to be similar. They're going to ask him to come in and, hey, hoist them up and let's get hot. Next is Wilhelm Breidenbach. He's a 6'10 sophomore. Got hurt early with a knee injury, played just 10 games, uh, averaging 3.7 points a game and 2.7 rebounds a game, shooting 36, 15, and 50. But obviously, expectation now that he's healthy is to play a bigger role in the, for the season. Yeah, I, I think it, it's it's up for debate whether he'll be able to win a starting spot. But if he doesn't, I still find it hard to imagine he won't be in the rotation somewhere. Uh, he was a very highly regarded recruit for them. Uh, they got him out of Matter Day High School, which is a long standing. I mean, for as long as I can remember, going back to the 70s, Matter Day was a uh, Catholic school in Southern California, was always producing high level talent. So he comes from a, you know, kind of a West Coast version of a Damatha, let's say, where they've just been a powerhouse forever. Uh, pretty highly regarded, not a superstar recruit, but a guy who had a lot of respect. And they had a lot of uh, optimism that he would be able to help them last season. Then he just got hurt too early. So he never really managed to, we never managed to find out what would he be like in late February of his freshman year? You know, would he have continued to grow? They say they're, they're taking it cautiously with him, but he is practicing. So it certainly seems like they are anticipating he will be back. And, you know, you look at those numbers last year, they're not very impressive, but I know that they believed when they got him that he was a guy who at 6'10", obviously had 
legit big man size, but that they also thought might be able to evolve into a perimeter threat. So we'll see if he's gotten better uh, as a shooter. Next is uh, Lithuanian Oleg, I think it's Kozhenets, uh, which actually, interestingly, in Lithuanian Kozhenets translates to legs appropriately since he's a seven foot <laughs> redshirt freshman. He took last year off basically just to work on his body and get a little strength, um, get ready for the set D1 level. And again, with him, I think it's it's unclear. These next three guys we're going to talk about are all red shirts. You know, that's a that's a rarity these days. You don't typically, you know, seeing anybody on your roster red shirting is not as common as it used to be. And to have three guys like that, it's and especially when your team was struggling, you would think <laughs> right. when you're struggling, you might say, "Hey, let's try something different." But they Hoiberg did not do that. Uh, but Kozhenets is a guy they really liked in last year's class, and they still think has a future. He just needs to continue to get stronger. But they also think over the long haul, he can be not just a guy around the rim, but actually has some ball skills as well. They think can shoot a little bit. So we'll see if he's able to uh, carve out minutes for himself this year. Yeah. Anything, anytime you get someone who can do a pick and roll and pull that defender out from uh, under yep. the basket, it's helpful. Uh, next is Quarren uh, McPherson. He's a 6'3 redshirt freshman guard. Yeah, East Coast guy. Um, his reputation is that he's tough, physical, and something Nebraska could actually really use has some defensive ability. Um that's something they can really, as I said, they can really use. Uh, we'll see if he breaks through into a consistent role in the rotation. I mean, obviously, when you lose four guys who were part of that perimeter group, as they did, there are opportunities here. And so the opportunity is there for McPherson, but he's going to have competition from a bunch of guys they brought in through the portal and in, in recruiting. Um We'll see, but I think it's possible that he finds his way into their rotation. Sure. Uh, the next player reminds me of a dad joke. Do you know what Mario's favorite pants are? Denim, denim, denim. So the next guy is Denim Dawson, athletic 6'6". <sighs> he was originally uh, for 22, but reclassified. Joined the team last year, and he redshirted. I think, we, and I don't know. I guess we'll see what he's going to turn into. Yeah, the, you know, they... Um... They like his athleticism, his size at 6'6". Six, six. I'm not sure how polished he is offensively. Um, but this looks to me, without without knowing a ton about it, we do see this now where, in fact, I know Minnesota's got a guy this year who fits this profile where they recruit a kid. He's got a year to play at the prep level, but also could theoretically uh, reclassify. And the decision gets made, well, even if I'm not going to play in college, I at least have that year or half a year. We've seen some of that in recent seasons of the Big Ten where a kid joins the team in January. Um, But I think the decision sometimes gets made, even if I don't play, I'm better off being in the program because I get access to the strength and nutrition program. I start to learn the plays. I start to learn the system at both ends that my coach wants to run. I'm in practice every day against these guys who help me get better. It's still worth my while, you know? Um, and most of the time uh, we see the, well, I should say most of the time, but oftentimes we're seeing these reclassification moves being made for exactly that reason, rather than, Oh, we got to hurry up and get this guy onto the court for us. In fact, when you do see those moves made as often as not, they seem to backfire. I mean, the classic recent example Indiana. of that is Christian Lander at Indiana. Yeah. who was a uh, highly rated. I mean, was on track to be a McDonald's all American type kid in his original class. He reclassifies because IU has a huge, huge problem at the point. And he spent two miserable seasons there and you, it's so bad. You have to wonder if he'll ever get back on track. You know, so sometimes it could really be damaging. But in this case, I think this is a safer move. We'll see. I mean, I, I don't have any indication that they're expecting huge things from Dawson this season. But um, I would imagine both parties felt it was in his long run best interest to get up there to Lincoln and and start at least functioning within the auspices of the program. And we'll see if it made a difference for him. Then we'll go to the newcomers. Joining the team is Sam Griesel. He's a 6'6", 220-pound transfer from North Dakota State. He's a grad transfer, I should say. 
Uh, and so the expectations for him to man the point, he averaged 14.3 points a game and 3.4 assists a game at North Dakota State and shot 48, 38, and 76. Yeah, you know, the big thing, and something Hoiberg has uh, trumpeted this offseason, is that Sam Griesel has actually played in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> right, yeah, right. So he's looking, and, and I will say, when you look at the guys Hoiberg has brought in in his previous years versus this group, he has added guys in this group. He's added two guys, Griso being one of them, who have played in, um, I'm sorry, Griso has played in the NCAA tournament, and then he added another kid who won, uh, I believe, won a JUCO national championship. He has not brought in guys who had anywhere near that kind of background in terms of being part of winning programs. Now you got to put a caveat on this North Dakota state, really good summit league program. They're right there with, I think it's South Dakota state, the Jack rabbits um, as the class of that league in recent years. So he came from a place that knows winning, but it's the summit league. He didn't transfer in from Kansas. (laughs) So I put a little bit of a caution on that. The numbers are fine. Uh, I will say I'm, and we'll come back to this when we look at their outlook. I am not convinced that he seems to be an answer at the point necessarily. I would probably feel much better about him if he was playing alongside somebody who was a little more of a traditional point guard and you were just asking to be the secondary guy, but that's not how it's going to go. I think he will have the ball in his hands a lot and he's almost certainly going to be the starter at the point to begin the season. Um, Shooting numbers were solid, but you know, we, we see with some level of frequency that guys making that move up in level, sometimes the shooting efficiency takes a hit. We'll see what happens with him, but they needed somebody and as far as somebody's go, he's not a bad, he's not a bad option. Right. And someone who may fit in a little bit more in the Nebraska since he just came from not too far away, North Dakota. Uh, the next would be J- right. Jawan Gary, 6'6", 220 pound transfer from Alabama. I imagine he also played the tournament or at least was with the team in the tournament. He's the second one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. There, I knew there were two. He, uh, yeah. he averaged six and a half points a game for the Crimson Tide and also had 3.4 rebounds a game and started uh, about half the games at 16 of the games. Is a big wingspan of seven feet. Yeah, I I would say I would probably expect Jawan Gary to be the starting four man alongside Walker at the five. That would be my guess to start the season because my sense of him is that he's not really a wing. He's not really a shooter, but he's got that wingspan. He's a, apparently got some athleticism. He's aggressive. And look, Nebraska needs that. So if you can bring in a guy who you think can help you on the boards, maybe help improve your defense, that's a win. So, uh, and again, as you said, coming from Alabama, at least you are talking about somebody who's been in a big time basketball environment and has been part of that, that kind of winning, you know, not that Alabama is an elite program by any means, but they've done some winning in the time he was there. So, uh, that may help things. We'll see if he's familiar with the 12 foot jump shot since he's coming from Alabama. Uh, next, yeah, right. Next would be Blaze Keita. He's a 6'11, uh, 240 pound Juco transfer from Coffeyville uh, Community College that you were alluding to earlier. He was uh, uh, scoring 12.8 points a game. He had 9.8 rebounds a game. And, you know, again, he's going to be in that mix to sort of compete for the four or five spots on the team. This would be the question. If if they want to go big and if they think Gary can handle minutes at the three, I could see a path for, for Keita to be the starting foreman. At the very least, he's going to be a really important part of this team because you're, you're talking about a guy who, as a junior college recruit, was considered one of the top five guys in the country in those ranks. So, you know, Juco is not what it used to be. It's not like the 70s and the 80s when – you know, you would have guys, the Larry Johnsons of the world would come out of those ranks and just dominate. You don't see that anymore, but there's a, there's reason to think that Keita can be an effective Big Ten level player. How effective? We'll see. Um, 
but you have to like the size. I mean, for a Nebraska team that just has not had very much playable size to have a 6'11", 240 pound guy, who's also got some game away from the rim reportedly, um, that could be a big deal. Next is Emmanuel Bamduel. He's a 6'4 transfer from SMU, averaged 10.6 points a game on 36, 35, and 82 shooting. Uh, most of his shots were actually outside three, about 40% of his shots. But that means he's also layups and other jumpers. Not a, you know, the 35% from three isn't terrible, but he only took 40% of his overall shots from outside the arc. So, you know, usually when you're seeing guys with a shooting number like that in the modern game, it's going to be 50% or more of their shots are from three. Not the, when he's a guard, not the case for uh, Bandumel. So that tells me he plays a little differently. Um, again, reportedly has some defensive ability, some toughness about him at six foot four, some good size for the wing. I think that's going to be the question is, do they go a little smaller and start Bandamel opposite Wilcher on the wing, have Gary at the four, and then Keita comes off the bench? Or do they go bigger and Bandamel is maybe your sixth man? But he's going to play a lot regardless, I think. So next we're going to get to their actual recruits. Uh, is it, I think it's Rommel Lloyd Jr., a 6'6 point guard. And he's right on the edge of about a one, top 100 recruit. So pretty good for Nebraska, considering as much as they've struggled. Yeah, he, interesting guy. His dad, I, I can remember, um, played a year at Syracuse and was a big-time recruit but didn't last long. Um, this kid is bigger than his father was. So he's six, six, but he actually played the point. He played at, uh, Sierra Canyon, which is a big time program in Southern California. Um, where a lot of, um, I'm trying to think, I think that's, I think that's where Marvin Bagley played a year. There've been a lot of guys. Oh, it's, I believe it's where, uh, Bronnie James has been playing for example. So it's definitely a program that a lot of big time talent has gone through in recent years. Um, again, I, not having seen him play a six, six point guard, I'm always suspicious. I have to see it to believe it. Uh, but because they don't have a lot of options, he really as a freshman even is probably in line to at the very least play backup minutes at that spot because they don't really have a, another obvious candidate behind Griselle. So I think it'll be Lloyd. Yeah. Well, that's certainly, I'm sure one of the appeals for coming to Nebraska, right? You've instantly, you're going to sort of buy, you're going to be forced into the You position. have a chance. You have a chance, yeah. but also, you know, maybe you don't have to be the guy too. So, you know, this, which is to the point uh, earlier talking about Landers from Indiana, you don't want to be the guy thrown into that position if you're not ready for it. Cause right. it could be a totally disaster. Right. I think we saw the same thing with Rocco Watts, right? I think he was just forced to do too, too much and just, just shattered his confidence right. and everything. So finally, it's Jamarcus Lawrence, a 6'3 guard from New Jersey, and his reputation comes in as a good shooter and a good defender, <laughs> both things with Nebraska needs. Yeah, and, and another guy who comes from a highly regarded program, with, with him it's the other coast, Roselle Catholic in uh, New Jersey, um, did a lot of winning in high school. They think he's a well-rounded player, can do a lot of things at a, at a reasonably high level. Again, open question. I mean, there's there's obviously a lot of minutes in that perimeter group. And so we've got some candidates for those minutes. You know, a guy like Lawrence, I would say, you know, he's in direct competition with a guy like McPherson, who redshirted but has been in the program for a year. So does that give McPherson a leg up or is Lawrence just enough a better player that he'll jump him? and and actually earn some minutes so it's it's an open question but at the very least it seems like nebraska should have some intriguing battles for for roles on this team and so then you know you look at this team obviously you don't think too highly of them when it comes to the big 10 you still have them finishing 14th which is where they finished last season talking about them it certainly sounds like there's potential for them to move up a little bit uh and then i think you know it's the fact that i think the big 10 is a little wide open but overall not too high prospects in this, you know, again, what does Nebraska have to do to make it look like they've got a chance for really building something? And I think obviously 14th place is not it, but you know, what's the, what's their ceiling, I guess is kind of the, first I would question. say, I would say for this team to be better on the court, 
um, three things have got to happen. They've got to figure out how to guard somebody. They've just been terrible defensively all three years, which is not a total shocker. Fred Hoiberg's teams at Iowa State were not typically great defensively. The difference was they were really, really good on offense. And so, you know, they were kind of like in Iowa has been in, in our league. Um, Nebraska has not done that. <laughs> they have not been nearly good enough offensively to overcome how bad they are at the other end. So any kind of improvement defensively would be welcome. At least on paper, you would think there's a chance for that because they've added some size. So that should help a little bit more rim protection, just bigger bodies, more athletic bodies in the paint should help you be a little better defending inside the arc, which is where it's all got to start. And then rebounding obviously has been just an absolute disaster. And to Hoiberg's credit, in the offseason, I read a couple of interviews done with him this summer. He has talked about that at length, that he knows they've got to find a way to get better on the glass. And he thinks he's got guys like Gary, like Keita, who can help them get there. Uh, Breedbach being back in the lineup should help as well. Um, so I, at least on paper, I can see the reasons why he might be optimistic about those two things getting a little bit better, but how much better do they get? That's an open question. And then I would say the third thing is at the offensive end, one thing Nebraska just has done terribly is over his tenure is shooting the ball. They've just been a terrible shooting team. I don't know at first blush if I believe this team has an obvious look to be a lot better shooting the ball. You know, one way would be if C.J. Wilcher significantly ups his volume but stays at the same level efficiency-wise, that'll help. Um, but if they could find a way to just be a little bit better as a group shooting shooting jumpers, that would help. So I don't know how likely any or all of those three things are. I, I also think, you know, offensively, a limiter might very well be uh, at the point because I'm, I'm not convinced. I, I think that there's a chance, a reasonably good chance that at least with Grisel, he'll be, um, won't be as prone to playing wildly and out of control as their last few point guards have, but is he going to be markedly better in terms of initiating, running, creating offense, being a dynamic player? I don't know. I think that's an I think that's very much an open question. And if there's not significant improvement at the point, it's hard to see how there could be really significant improvement offensively as a whole. So that may be your one big limiter. I think in the positive in the positive column, you look at it and say Walker and Wilcher, while not stars by any means, are proven Big Ten level contributors who most importantly don't just put up counting numbers. They actually play efficiently. They shoot the ball. Well, they don't seem to do a lot of things that are outside of their capabilities. They don't get wild. So that's a good starting point for things. And yeah, other than that, <laughs> uh, you're, you're counting on a lot of unknowns to, you know, come up big for you. And sometimes that happens, but you know, more often than not, it doesn't. I, I contrast this with what we saw from two other programs last year that had new coaches, Penn State, and Minnesota, you know, the, and Penn State historically is one of the few major conference programs that might be able to say, boy, I wish we had what Nebraska had. I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not positive if Penn State has outdone them in NCAA tournament appearances all time. It's got to be close. Um, Minnesota obviously has done a lot more yeah. over time, but in the last, geez, 25 years, Minnesota, basically since Clem Haskins uh, left, they've been and also ran at best in the Big Ten most of the time. But I look at Minnesota and I look at Penn State last year, and both of those programs were short on talent. They were short on experience. They were short on depth. All these things that are similarities with Nebraska. But the difference was – you could see with both of those programs that those coaches had a style of play and expectations 
both those teams played really hard. They didn't always play well, but they played hard. There was an effort there, and you could see a totally different style, but the same kind of things that had me feeling very optimistic after year one for Steve Peichel at Rutgers. I could see it. I could see, okay, they don't have a lot of guys who can play, but there's a plan in place. And you could see how this coach is going to make sure that the guys he brings in going forward fit into that plan. And so now the key is, can they just get the talent level improved? And at Rutgers, Steve Peichel did that. Um, It remains to be seen whether that will happen at Penn State and Minnesota, but I think if you're fans of those two programs, you have to at least have some level of optimism after what you saw last year. Okay, these guys at least know, look like they know what they're doing. I'm not sure we could say that about what's going on in Lincoln. And that's that's as much as anything else. That's why I've got them 14th. I, Fred Hoiberg's just got to give me some reason to feel like, okay, I can see something coherent happening here. I could see a plan and I could see it starting to develop and see guys starting to fit into it and see standards being put into place and guys being held to account to reach those standards or they don't, or they're not part of it going forward. And we haven't seen that. All we've seen is a revolving door of guys coming in and out year to year without any real measurable difference in success. It does feel very random, doesn't it? It feels like yes, that someone that's sort of a good gra- word for it. Kind of grasping at like uh, statistics or just like any player who looks like they're good without having any sort of idea of what you're putting them into, right? It's like, oh, I love cinnamon, and so you just toss it in some recipe. What you know, you're, you're making yeah. should have cinnamon in it. Look, I mean, it's it's a more exciting brand of basketball, I guess, to watch than what Tim Miles played because Tim Miles' teams generally played fairly slowly. You know, Hoiberg's teams are up and down. You know, they're playing fast. But to me, as a fan, I, first of all, the bottom line is, can you win? Right. Winning is important. Yeah. You can. I think, you know, the, the fans of the Wisconsin Badgers program over the last 25 years have not witnessed a lot of flying up and down the floor. But I think in general, they're probably reasonably OK with what they've seen, right? Because yeah. it's been successful. And that's the bottom line for everybody. But even just the aesthetics of it, playing with pace is fine. It's great. But not if you're just chaotic. And that's what Nebraska's been. It's been absolute chaos. Yeah, they are team entropy. And uh, yeah. so we, we'll end then, uh, I guess, the show there with uh, Nebraska, number 14 pick. We'll pick up again next week with the next team. At number 13, uh, Minnesota. That's your spoiler alert. I would also encourage you to go to tffinotsagain.com and then you can sign up for the email list. You can email us your predictions for the Big Ten standings from 1 through 14 at tffinots at gmail.com. And again, continue to subscribe, share the show with the other Spartan friends. Make sure they're aware of the show so they're all ready for game time in just a couple weeks. Until next time, the Final Four is not on the schedule. Go Green. <music> Nothing is more powerful than the connection between a storyteller and their audience. Over 100 million Americans listen to podcasts every month, forming lasting connections with their favorite creators. And 56% of those listeners have purchased a product after hearing about it on a podcast. But there's an art to building meaningful relationships between consumers, hosts, and brands. Ad Results Media has it down to a science. Ad Results Media specializes in helping breakthrough brands join the conversation at scale. With over 20 years of expertise, Ad Results Media amplifies brand stories across thousands of shows, publishers, and emerging platforms. They're a data driven matchmaker, strategically pairing world changing brands with engaged audiences to create the sound of success. For an experienced partner to help your brand find the right audience, achieve long term growth, and improve advertising ROI, look no further. Be part of the story. Learn more at adresultsmedia.com slash story. That's adresultsmedia.com slash story.